foreshadowing hits differently. And whew, don't even get me started on introducing things you love to people you like and getting to watch them experience it for the first time. Or, or hitting up a movie that you watched like a decade ago that you've forgotten most of the details of, but you still get hit with that delicious nostalgia. It's good shit. Neither time nor people are stagnant. The ever-changing sum of our experiences is permanently transformative. So trying to capture a moment in a bottle, to live in rather than remember, is only ever, at best, a waste of energy, and at worst, a one-way ticket to the abyss. This is what hierarchy is and does. It is the attempt to have dominion over the flow of time, to position the pieces just so and then glue them down. It is objectification in the truest sense of the word, the distilling of dynamic subjects into objects, as though they are vessels that exist to perform whatever functions have been projected onto them forever. Hierarchy is the fairy tale of endless economic growth, of wars fought and won and finished, of permanence, of a pre-designed, universally applicable step-by-step -step guide to succeeding in life, of an unchanging, unconditional, and eternal love, of a binary existence. Hierarchy is the fantasy that safety can be cultivated through control. The hierarchical systems that dictate our lives aren't going to spontaneously disappear, no matter how badly we may want them to. We need to set our sights on something better and then actively make choices that bring us materially closer to those ideals. Ongoing exposure and participation is transformative, prefigurative even. The ideas, beliefs, values, and behaviors that are modeled for us and available to us are the ones that inform our understanding of the world. People are always talking about human nature this and human nature that, like it's some kind of great revelation. Obviously, people have an easier time operating within the systems that surround them. Obviously, people are affected by their upbringings. Obviously, people reproduce and build upon the only ideas and foundational material that they've been given access to, especially when alternative ideas are intentionally and systemically suppressed by people who believe that they stand to benefit from the status quo. To look at people in capitalist society and conclude that human nature is egoism is looking at people in a factory where pollution is destroying their lungs and saying that it is human nature to cough. If we're serious about wanting things to be different, then we need the capacity to imagine things which are different. <laughs> One of my favorite things is when I spend hours upon hours meticulously explaining the ins and outs of a hierarchical system how it came to be, why it works, the undesirable impacts of said system, potential areas of intervention for dismantling said system, and then someone comes along very helpfully and is just like, no, but you don't understand, that's how the system works. All the things you're complaining about are inherent to the system functioning. Without those things, the system wouldn't even be a thing anymore. My sibling in Christ. <laughs> Between the two of us, I am not the one experiencing confusion right now. I get that people shop fast fashion because self-expression and desirability and respectability are required for both connection and currency, and that if your labor is being exploited, then there isn't enough leftover time and energy to make your own clothing, and there isn't enough leftover money to pay someone the fair value of their labor. I know that it's inherently exhausting and demoralizing to be fighting an uphill battle every moment of every day while wielding the heavy-ass, blunt-ass weapons you've been handed. I understand the cyclical nature of exploitation that these systems require to function. My critique is not of individuals doing their best to live well within the systems that they have access to. It is of the systems that prevent us from accessing truly liberatory alternatives. Free will is fake. There are many ways to conceptualize freedom, and the one that resonates most with me is, unsurprisingly, a dialectic. Two seemingly oppositional forces that, when in communication with one another, have the potential to synthesize truth. My belief is that freedom, to act, to change, to be, occurs when there is an alignment between internal and external power. Internal power referring to the variables that are cultivated within oneself, knowledge, skill, desire, these variables which are incorporeal, the manifestation of idealism. So follows, external power refers to the variables which are cultivated outside of the self. Circumstances, opportunity, resources, community, variables which are tangible, the manifestation of materialism. These are, of course, moving parts that necessarily inform one another. The dichotomy between materialism and idealism is a false one. Our material conditions influence which knowledge, skills, and desires we have the capacity to access, which influences the material conditions that we have the capacity to construct, which influences our internal power, which influences our external power, and so on ad infinitum. That's what power is, the actualized capacity derived from the relationship of those two forces. In other words, people only have access to what they have access to. People are like spreadsheets. Genetic variables and life experiences can be thought of as like a data set of variables which act as inputs. When applied contextually, in reference to the totality of their journey through space-time, these inputs produce specific outcomes. The spreadsheet that we have most access to is our own, although even then only partially. So attempting to apply formulas that we've discerned for ourselves, this process of if this then that, to other people will always yield inaccurate results, yeah? 
Just because I like biscuits doesn't mean that you like biscuits. And just because I wanted biscuits yesterday with tea doesn't mean that I'm going to want them tomorrow with tuna. Still with me? If we time travel to the past and somehow swapped your soul with someone else's at birth, nothing that followed would change. Upon returning to the present, you would simply be that person. It wouldn't be a body swap where you retained parts of your personality while living through different experiences. You wouldn't be an approximation or a, a copycat. You would embody their very essence. Every thought they've ever had, every emotion, every dream, you would have made all of the same choices, exhibit all of the same mannerisms, and believe all of the same things. And they would be you. We're here because we're here. If you live the same day over and over with your memory wiped at the end of each cycle, every moment would be identical no matter how many times the cycle repeated. With no change in variables, I will always have wanted biscuits with tea yesterday. Sometimes people find this concept to be kind of depressing or defeatist, but I think it's really the opposite. If we understand people to be the sum of their experiences, then we know that by understanding those experiences, we can find methods of effective intervention. Change becomes an achievable possibility. There are patterns amongst humans, certain combinations of traits and experiences that are more or less likely to yield particular outcomes. And yet simultaneously, the holistic sum of those traits and experiences is completely unique to each individual. So the only way to even have a shot at predicting accurate outcomes is to seek out those patterns by communicating with others, and especially by seeking to understand folks with different traits and experiences than our own. And I mean, look, if you believe in free will, that is totally your prerogative, and I'm not here to tell you you're wrong, but it is evidently an ineffective framework to operate with. As far as I'm concerned, the value in this blend of determinism and positionality isn't gleaned from its status as universal truth, but from its utility. Even if we don't agree that people are wholly constructed by their circumstances, if you think that on some level people just are the way that they are, that they can be evil, shitty, cruel, selfish, lazy, incompetent, manipulative or ignorant due to some inherent quality branded on their soul that no circumstances could alter, or that they simply choose to be that way because it grants them some kind of perceived advantage then it still follows that the best way to address this reality is to adapt and accommodate. We'd still have to shift the way that we organize our lives and our communities in such a way that prevents anyone from acquiring a privileged position or status within it that might allow them to coerce and exploit others. Because if some people just are awful, ruling others is a possibility, and antisocial behavior grants an advantage, then it will always be folks with antisocial tendencies who rule, right? Or not! Feel free to bootstrap and personal responsibility yourselves into oblivion, I guess. I'm not a cop. <laughs> I'm a fucking nerd on YouTube, Jesus Christ. Nonetheless, I believe that if we collectively woke up tomorrow and suddenly all of the hierarchical structures we live within were gone, no longer being enforced by the state or whatever, we would collectively immediately recreate them. Even if the slate were somehow wiped clean, all bank accounts set to zero, laws and policies changed to enshrine equal rights, everyone was literally transformed into identical gray blobs we, the people mysteriously isekai to this brave new world, would not be blank canvases. We would bring along the hierarchy that's been baked into us over the course of our fucking lifetimes. We might create completely different hierarchies. Actually, we're the greyest and the blobbiest. But hierarchies they would be. And that makes perfect sense, because that is the skill set that we've inherited and the trauma that we've spent our lives developing coping mechanisms for. Thanks to colonialism, everything else pretty much has been or is on its way to becoming wiped out. To actually have any hope of cultivating a new, different system, we'd literally have to snipe everyone alive and then ourselves. Unless there was some way to enact change transformatively, restoratively. A way to become people with the skill sets, desires, and resources to organize ourselves differently. A way to build the new within the shell of the old. Or as historical anarchists put it, to build the embryo of the human society of the future. Good news, there are ways to do that. Bad news, it's difficult and unintuitive. It is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, and easier to imagine the end of capitalism than what comes after. But we, unironically, need to be able to do just that. We need to have some idea of where we're headed and what's going to replace the systems that we're so hellbent on dismantling. And people understand that, intrinsically, which is I think where a lot of the skepticism around anarchism comes from, and even around certain emancipatory ideas within anarchist spaces. The opposite of disempowered isn't powerful, it's empowered. In order to empower people to enact change, we need to start by understanding the factors that are currently contributing to their disempowerment. In my experience, hearing the phrase, that sounds good in theory but doesn't work in practice in reference to liberatory ideas is like a dead giveaway that someone hasn't meaningfully engaged the theory really at all. They've engaged the conclusions. 
And that's not like an individual issue to be resolved. The fact that this theory is so inaccessible to so many people is a systemic problem, or more accurately, a symptom of a system working exactly as it's meant to. You don't need to pour a ton of time and energy and resources into understanding the practical application of hierarchy because we are drenched in it. You can take Econ 101 and immediately internalize supply and demand, the idea that markets determine value, because that's how the world currently works. You've seen it in action since you were a child. You've heard about it since you were in middle school. The introductory theory doesn't need to spin you in a 180 or even expand your periphery. It doesn't need to make any connections between seemingly unrelated phenomena. It just highlights and reinforces what's already in front of you. And that's fine. We do need to understand what's in front of us, know thy enemy and all that. But it's so much easier because you get to just go with the flow. It's what we've been prefigured for. You don't need to understand anything about the inner mechanisms of a camera to know that when you push the button, a photo is taken. Until it doesn't. Until something breaks or your photos turn out to be somehow disappointing to you. Likewise, you don't need to take one single gender studies class in order to engage with society in a way that reinforces cis-heteropatriarchy, or white supremacy, or ableism, or adultism, or monogamy, it's modeled for you everywhere. We only come to interrogate these systems when faced with tension, either first-hand via marginalization or second-hand via exposure and education. In other words, we realize these molds are not designed to encapsulate nor enhance the vastness of the human experience by trying and failing to conform and or by internalizing the experiences of those who do not conform and now operate outside of the arbitrary guidelines enforced by these systems. We only start to ask questions when confronted with evidence that these molds are not set in stone. They are lines of chalk on the ground that have the potential to be redrawn or washed away as we see fit. But if not this, then what? Right? Surely we can't just break down the world order and call it a day. What about undesirable labor? What about bad actors? What about limited resources? What about experts? What about homes? What about food? What about scalability? What about criminals? What about climate? Very good. These are good questions. Important questions. I think the answers I have to offer are going to be initially unsatisfactory to you, but stay the course. You can ask these questions to 10 different anarchists and get at least 10 different answers. There might be some common themes among them around mutual aid, consensus, abolitionism, and so on, but when it comes to nailing down the day-to-day -day specifics, it gets very, very slippery. And when you're accustomed to hierarchy, this seems like inconsistency and incoherency, but there are two fundamental flaws to that line of thinking. First is that perfectionism is a curse that prevents action. This all-or-nothing standard of certainty demands perfect solutions to problems which have never been solved. The systems we currently operate under are buckling under the weight of these very crises. None of the valid concerns regarding potentially harmful effects of a new system have been fixed by any of the existing social structures and are in fact being literally exacerbated right now. And second, we can't know. If we can understand that our lived experiences transform us, then it follows that they have transformed us. There is no hitting the undo button. We can't control Z ourselves out of this one. There is only understanding, accommodating, and adapting. We can't know how these things would work within a society designed to cultivate anarchy because we live within a society designed to cultivate hierarchy. We have hierarchical brain rot. We can make guesses, sure, but the value in these thought experiments isn't in the solutions we come up with themselves. The solutions are inevitably lacking. We can't actually project ourselves into the future because our experience of time is linear. If anarchy can exist, then the people who have the power to cultivate anarchy will come long after we are gone, and they will come with answers we could never have conceived of. Which isn't to throw our hands up and paint a scenario where there's nothing to do but wait for them. If we fap about going, ah, oh, well, the next generations will solve it, then they won't have the chance to. It's on us to forge the tools they need and reshape the world in their favor. We are simultaneously developers and beta testers. We are quality assurance and software engineers. We are the features and the bugs. And as the conscience, determination, and capacity of men continuously develop and find means of expression in the gradual modification of the new environment and in the realization of desires in proportion to their being formed and becoming imperious, so it is with anarchism. Anarchism cannot come but little by little slowly but surely growing in intensity and extension. Therefore, the subject is not whether we accomplish anarchism today, tomorrow, or within 10 centuries, but that we walk towards anarchism today, tomorrow, and always. I think that there is value in engaging with these hypotheticals and thought experiments, but that it's in measuring the evolution and expansion of our own and noticing the minute shifts in what we're capable of coming up with and noticing how those shifts reshape the ways we interact with the world and how the world interacts with us in turn. It's really more of like a, a progress bar that we can mine for dopamine by testing against previous markers, watching it fill up within and throughout our lifetimes. We're not capable of true anarchy yet, but we're capable of practicing anarchism in ways that genuinely increase our capacity, that better equip ourselves, the people around us, and the people who come after us for anarchy. So not knowing isn't a cop-out. 
It is an acknowledgement of fact and a very deliberate refusal to fall into the trap of confusing means for ends. We anarchists do not want to emancipate the people. We want the people to emancipate themselves. My project is not making an anarchy. It's making anarchists. Partly because anarchists are a prerequisite to capital A anarchy, yes, but mostly because anarchists are awesome. Joyful, passionate, empathetic, collaborative problem solvers with a shared vision and the capacity to execute are exactly the types of people that I want to surround myself with. Nothing beats being in community with folks who ask interesting questions and chase after interesting answers, who see the limitations of what is as a, a challenge rather than a rule.